Okay, so our the t we our last symposium was uh, on the somewhat self-interested um, uh, topic of how we can get um, uh, AI to do what we want. Now we're going to switch to the point of view of the AI itself and ask about the moral status of AI um, and with questions uh, of the sort of what the rights of AI are, how, a, how the moral status depends on um, uh, cognitive abilities. Our first speaker is Matthew Lau. He's the Arthur Zittrain Professor of Bioethics at NYU, the director of the Center for Bioethics, um, uh, uh, the editor of the uh, Journal of Moral Philosophy, and the founder of the Ethics Etc. group blog. He's interested in a broad spectrum of philosophical issues centering on ethics, bioethics, and moral psychology, and his title is going to be Artificial Intelligence and Moral Status. Great. Thank you, Ned. Can, can everybody hear me okay? Great. Okay, so a um, couple years ago when I uh, shared an office, well, not shared an office, when I had my office next door to Nick Bostrom, we actually tried to write a paper on this topic on artificial intelligence and moral status, but we never got around to finishing it. So I'm really glad to have this opportunity to uh, think more about this topic. So machines and artificial intelligence are, uh, are acquiring more and more capacities. We have uh, Deep Blue winning. Uh, speak into the mic. Okay. Uh, we have Deep Blue uh, winning the chess, uh, uh, winning in chess. Uh, Watson uh, winning in Jeopardy and AlphaGo. They also some of them are acquiring mobility. Uh, they can move around. We have the Google self-driving cars, and efforts are underway to build machines that can recognize emotions. So the so-called uh, effective intelligence. And the possibilities that AIs may acquire human level or even greater than human level intelligence is being seriously considered indeed by many people in this room. As, AI, as AIs gain more and more capacities, the issue of whether they will acquire greater uh, moral status becomes salient. Moral status is the standing that an entity has that gives moral agents a potential reason to act towards it in a certain way. So for example, cats have a certain uh, status in virtue of being sentient. Their mor moral status qua sentience gives moral agents at least a potential reason not to, uh, uh, to uh, a potential reason to act towards them in a certain way. So for example, not to cause them unnecessary pain. So what kind of uh, moral status will AIs have as they gain greater and greater capacities? Will they one day have human level moral status? Will they have greater than human level moral status? To answer these questions, we need a theory of moral status. So I'm going to begin by sketching such a theory. So to start, here's a list of um, entities that could have or could have moral status. And it's not intended to be exhaustive. So we have inanimate objects, rocks, the environment, non-human terrestrial living uh, things, plants, animals, bacteria, et cetera, et cetera. Normal functioning human beings with full uh, physical, cognitive, emotional, and social capacities. So uh, normal adult human beings. Damaged human beings, the comatose, the severely mentally disabled. Human beings at the beginning of life, so fetuses, infants possible future human beings, future generations, uh, non-living human beings, dead human beings, um, and we could also talk about aliens, you know, if they exist, and we're going to apply this to AI and robots. So how do we determine what kind of moral status um, each of these entities has? So here are some constraints. First, it seems that we need some kind of objective empirical method. And the reason is that there doesn't seem to be an a priori way of knowing what kind of moral status an entity has. So for example, if we were to meet some alien beings um, when we go to Mars, uh, and we want to know what kind of moral status it has, it seems that we would not be able to know this a priori. 
to, um, to find out, it seems that we would at least have to investigate empirical, uh, empirically what attribute it has and consider whether these attributes are normally salient, uh, such that the alien should have a cer certain kind of moral status. A second constraint is something called the species neutrality requirement. So the idea here is that the criterion for moral status should not exclude any species in advance. An example of a criterion that would exclude um, other species in advance is being human. Being human would exclude all other human species. So, that, so being human doesn't satisfy the uh, species neutrality uh, criterion. A third constraint is that the empirical criterion should be based on the intrinsic properties of an entity. So this is kind of controversial, but most people think that it's based on the intrinsic properties of an ent entity. So the intrinsic properties of an entity are properties that are internal or inherent to an entity. The extrinsic properties of an entity are properties that depend on an entity's relationship with other entities. So for example, being a moral agent is an intrinsic property that a no normal functioning adult human being typically would have. Whereas being a spouse uh, would be an extrinsic property that depends on someone's being married to another person. So um, suppose that you and your spouse are both drowning. You would, of course, value your spouse more based on your relationship with her and try to save her first. But in one respect, your spouse and your, the stranger would still have the same moral status in virtue of the fact that they're both moral agents. Okay. So here's some criterion for moral status. Uh, whether an entity is alive, whether an entity is conscious, uh, whether it's sentient, whether it can feel pain, uh, whether it can desire, whether it has the capacity to know something about the causality, such as if one does X, then Y would happen, and the capacity to bring about something intentionally, so rational capacity, and whether it has the capacity to understand uh, and act in light of moral reasons, so moral agency. So next, it seems that some entities are going to have greater moral status than others. So for example, if you compare <laughs> a rock <laughs> with a plant, it seems that the plant would have greater moral status. Uh, and an obvious explanation is that the plant is alive, but the rock isn't. And among entities that are alive, arguably some will have greater moral status than others. So if you compare a plant and a turtle, it seems that the turtle would have greater moral status um, than, uh, than the plant. And an uh, explanation of that is that the turtle is sentient and the plant isn't. And finally, among entities that are sentient, obvious, uh, arguably some will have even greater moral status than others. So take a, a normal functioning adult human being and an adult. <laughs> it seems that uh, the human being would have, have greater moral status than the turtle. And the explanation here is something like uh, the human being has moral agency while the turtle doesn't. I'm, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So let me say something about the basis of human moral status. The kind of moral status that human beings have is often called right holding. They're called right holders. So one, the question we want to ask is, are all human beings right holders? So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, says all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. But it turns out that it's actually quite difficult to defend this claim. Philosophers who have examined it have tended to find themselves either agreeing that no, not all human beings are right holders, or adopting what Peter Singer calls a specious position, where speciesism is defined as morally favoring a particular species, in this case human beings, without over others without sufficient justification. So wh why is this? Well, the problem is that there doesn't seem to be a relevant empirical attribute that would apply to all human beings. So take actual sentience, for example. Some human beings, such as an encephalic infant or a comatose person, uh, lack, uh, lacks um, actual sentience. Or take actual moral agency. Many human beings, including newborn infants, lack actual moral agency. These human beings will not be right holders on uh, these accounts of right holding. And this is called the, the problem of marginal cases. So elsewhere, I've actually argued that uh, we can have an account that uh, doesn't have to be speciest. Uh, 
and that appears to allow all human beings to be right holders. And what this account says is that a sufficient condition for an entity to be a right holder is if the entity has the genetic, or more generally, the physical basis for moral agency. Let me just very briefly sketch this account. So the physical basis for moral agency is the set of physical codes that generate moral agency. In human beings, this uh, set of physical codes is located in their genome. And we know this because a lot of complexity is needed as the developmental basis for a complex adaptive phenotype like moral agency, and the genome contains a significant portion of this complexity. So to have the genetic basis for moral agency, the genes that make up moral agency must be activated and be coordinating with each other in an appropriate way. A being does not have the genetic basis for a certain attribute if it just possesses somewhere in its genome the genes for that, uh, that could make up the attribute, but these genes are either not activated or are scrambled in such a way that they do not coordinate with each other appropriately. Let me just flesh that out. So uh, consider, suppose there's a book that contains uh, many random words, which if put together would result in a Shakespeare book. This book would not be a Shakespeare book because uh, it just contains uh, the correct words. These words must be organized and be coordinated in the right kind of way. So I've argued that it can actually be shown that all human beings, including infants, the severely disabled, those in persistent vegetative state, and so on, have the genetic basis for moral agency. So given this, on my account, they would all be right holders. And this account avoids speciesism because if it turns out that gorillas and chimpanzees and other animals have the genetic basis for moral agency, or more generally, the physical basis for moral agency, they would also be right holders. And let me just add that this account is compatible with permissive views about abortion. So we can follow Judas Jarvis Thompson and say that even if, if a fetus is a right holder, a woman still have a, has a right to determine what happens inside her body. That is, she has a right to bodily integrity. Okay. Let me just mention one other feature of this, um, this account. So there's this idea of the function of right holding, which says that if and when the right holder's interest is in conflict with the same kind of interest, that is, with the comparable interest of a non-right holder, the right holder's interest should prevail. So just to take an example, suppose that you have a choice between serving a uh, saving a turtle's limb and a, a human being's limb. The turtle's, limb, uh, the turtle's interest in keeping the limb and the human being's interest in keeping the limb, uh, the limb uh, appear to be uh, comparable. The function of right holding says that you should save the human being's limb, which seems to be the correct verdict. Okay. So um, is the, let us now consider what kind of moral status AIs can have. Is the AI alive? Is the AI conscious? Um, is the AI sentient? Can the AI uh, feel pain? Can the AI desire? Does the AI have rational agency? Uh, does the AI have moral agency? If an AI can acquire some or all of these capacities, it will gain the kind of moral status that accompanies each of these intrinsic properties. And I just realized that I printed my uh, notes ran out. So I'm going to have to free it. <laughs> so uh, ran out of paper on my, in my, on my printer. Technology. OK. So um, hmm, OK. So uh, yes. Would you hold the mic in your hand? Yes, OK. I can do that very easily. Yeah, OK. Uh, yes, more paper clips. That's right. So. Um, so the idea, so, you know, uh, I mean, one of the issues that we're interested in finding out is whether AIs can hum have human level moral status. So I think that th there's a way for AIs to have human moral uh, level status. Uh, and that is, it, it's sufficient if an AI has the physical basis for moral agency. So that sort of comes out of uh, my account of right holding. And again, that physical basis has to be active and be coordinating in the right way. So it's not enough that these phys physical codes are just sort of randomly strewn somewhere. It has to be activated and in the right kind of way. Um, so then there's a further issue, which is whether AIs uh, can have uh, greater than human level moral status. And I think uh, the answer to that question is sort of possibly 
But I want to argue that um, if that's true, it's not going to be based on extending the current criteria that we have for moral sta uh, sta status, such as uh, rationality or moral, moral agency. So let me explain why. So take here uh, two people. So take rationa uh, rational agency, for example. Uh, so first, you got two people, right? You have a bright who's above average intelligence say 150 IQ, then you have average, uh, seems uh, average intelligence, say 100 IQ. It seems that uh, even though bright is a lot brighter than average, we would say that they have equal moral status. They're both right holders. So if they're, uh, say they're both are drowning, it seems that we would, uh, maybe we should toss a coin. We wouldn't think that uh, we necessarily have to uh, save above average, right? And we wouldn't think that we would be doing something morally impermissible if we were to save average. OK. Um, now, suppose you got somebody who's exceptionally bright. So the, uh, this person has exceptional intelligence, uh, 350 IQ. And then we still have the average here. Again, it seems that we wouldn't necessarily think that we should save except, except exceptionally bright. Um, OK. Uh, and if that's the case, then if an AI is also exceptionally bright, say has 350 IQ, it doesn't seem like we would say that just because it's really smart, it has greater moral status. So it's, uh, it's not gonna be, they're gonna have the same kind of moral status even though uh, they have different, they, they, they differ in their uh, levels of intelligence. What about moral agency? A lot of people, you know, one of, the, one of my, uh, my accounts says that, you know, there's something really important about moral agency. So you might think, well, how about if, you know, someone is really moral? What if, what, you know, what if we amplify uh, moral agency, the capacity for moral agency? Again, I don't think that it's going to change uh, whether these uh, two people are uh, uh, right holders so, uh, or have different uh, moral status. So take... Here, Joe has average moral agency, and Teresa has exceptional moral agency. Again, we wouldn't think that Teresa, we should uh, always save Teresa and not Joe, uh, and we would think that it would be impermissible to save Joe if, you know, if say they were both in some sort of uh, uh, emergency situation. And so you can do the same thing. You can imagine AIs that are, uh, have exceptional moral agency. And we wouldn't, again, uh, say that. Uh, it seems that we would say the same thing, that they have equal uh, moral status. So the upshot of that is that if AIs, uh, these uh, AIs are going to have greater than human moral status, it's going to, uh, and I'm not saying that that's not possible, it's that it's going to have to come from somewhere else, like some other attributes. Uh, some other normatively salient attribute. Okay, so let me just uh, finally conclude by talking about how we can get to uh, artificial moral intelligence. This is talking about the future. I have stuff to say about um, self-driving cars as well, uh, but um, I'm just here just only focusing on the future artificial moral intelligence. I think there are two ways to get there, uh, through gradual substitution and through coding. So a lot of people have talked about gradual substitution, so I'm going to be very brief. So basically the idea here is that an individual's brain is replaced by an inorganic substitute gradually. So imagine that your brain and you gradually replace it neuron by neuron with sort of in, in, an in, or, inorganic substitute. Now assuming that consciousness is maintained, and this is a big assumption, there's a huge question about whether, you know, when you substitute uh, the neurons, whether at some point the, um, the consciousness might just disappear. But just, um, so I'm, um, you know, making this big assumption that consci uh, consciousness is maintained. Now there's a question, suppose that the resulting being survives, right? It seems that this would be a, an artificial moral, uh, this would be an, uh, uh, an entity with artificial moral intelligence. So that's sort of one way by which we can get artificial moral intelligence. Here's another way of, uh, and, but, but you, know, it, you know, a lot of people are talking about coding artificial moral intelligence. Um, and here I want to say, and they're talking about sort of, uh, I think, uh, they're talking about, I think this is true whether it's uh, top, top down or bottom up. 
right? They're talking about coding things, putting moral theories like consequentialism, deontology, and virtue ethics into these um, AIs. And I don't think that's gonna work. Um, I think that these uh, principles uh, and norms um, and um, are too specific and too high level for us to try to uh, code into AIs. Not the least because um, there are so many of them and it's just, it seems like it's impossible to put in all the different rules, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I wanna suggest a different alternative and this is based on sort of uh, some work in uh, moral psychology uh, on the universal moral grammar. So the idea here is that the mind may be equipped with a universal moral grammar that enables each of us in different cultures unconsciously and automatically to evaluate a limitless variety of actions and generate more evaluations uh, such as right and wrong. So this came from John Rawls and Mikhail uh, drawing on Chomsky's work. So uh, the, the, the way the moral faculty works is that it has domain general cognitive mechanisms uh, generating representations of actions based on variables such as agent, uh, intention, belief, action, receiver, consequence, and moral evaluation. And then some cognitive mechanisms, for example, the moral faculty then combine these representations to generate moral judgments such as impermissible, permissible, and obligatory. I just uh, published a book called The Moral Brains that has a lot, um, 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 that cover, discusses a lot of these topics, so in case you wanna look at it. Um, okay, so th the idea here is that maybe we can draw on the universal moral grammar to have some sort of artificial moral grammar. So what we, we need are codes that would represent various variables over there, and then combine these representations to generate moral judgments, okay? Um, and one uh, other thing is that I think that genuine uh, uh, artificial moral intelligence um, are gonna be, uh, are gonna need to understand why a certain action is the morally right or wrong action. That is, they're gonna, it, uh, these um, sort of, uh, the way we tell whether we've succeeded is whether they can uh, understand whether an action is right or wrong. It's not gonna be enough that they know a bunch of moral propositions. And so I think the holy grail of uh, artificial moral intelligence is gonna be moral understanding. So just to wrap up, I think AIs can achieve human level moral status when they have the physical basis for moral agency. To have greater than human level moral status, AI needs to acquire some other norm normatively salient capacity besides rational agency and moral agency. And a genuine uh, artificial moral intelligence will have the capacity for moral understanding. Thank you. So with your um, presentation you just gave us, it seems like the, you um, dwelt um, on a lot of different terminology that you've defined in the first half of your presentation, you. particularly moral agency. Um, I was a little confused about um, one of the examples you gave us, and even though this is a very sensitive issue to a lot of people, I hope you can deal sure. with the terminology sure. in particular. Mm. Um, according to your claims, an unborn child has the genetic or physical basis to have, a moral agent to have moral agency because a chi unborn child has its own genetic code. How then do you rationalize abortion? Does a woman's right to bodily integrity supersede an unborn child's moral status? Yeah, I think it does. So I, I think I cover that. So they have the right to bodily integrity. Mm -hmm. And elsewhere, I have a whole uh, discussion about sort of uh, a human right. So I think bodily integrity is a fundamental condition for pursuing the basic activities. And so, um, so they have a right to that. And that's why, it, um, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Bruce yes. Costa from mm -hmm. Granite Forest Senga, mm -hmm. and um, I noticed uh, you had stated somewhat axiomatically about the differentiation we would make if someone were drowning, and I, uh, maybe I'm alone in the room, but I, I struggle with that as an axiom that we wouldn't say save Mother Teresa before the mm -hmm. boy, or perhaps good, good, good. allow yeah. Yeah. Adolf Hitler to drown mm -hmm. before the boy, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So I wonder if you could just kind of speak a little more on that, and if you would like, say what you were going to say about automated cars. So, so. Uh, <laughs> I think I will talk about that because I'll take another uh, uh, paper, uh, a talk. But um, 
I will say that, so Hitler or something like that, I mean, you know, if someone does something morally wrong, there are sort of different theories about desert, and that's sort of, you can sort of think that the claim is an uh, other things being equal claim. So other things being equal, if you're talking about two strangers, it seems like you should, um, you know, you should flip a coin. And if one is just smarter, so you know, if you, if uh, two patients go into the, uh, I, you know, uh, you know, sort of emergency room, you wouldn't say, hey, let's see, this one is smarter. Let's save this one first. You know, like that would, it seems like that would be totally wrong, right? And so, uh, but there are disagreements about that. I mean, some, you know, if you're a consequentialist, you might think, oh no, we really, if we could tell, then we really should say the smarter uh, person. I disagree with that, but I, 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 I agree with you that there is an issue there. Thanks, Matthew. That was great. Um, I um, I just wanted to ask you. You said at some point that um, you thought the method for figuring out moral status yeah. would have to be empirical, and the reason you gave is that you'd have to empirically figure out what attributes a particular organism or creature has. Yeah. But of course, there's the question what attributes they have, and then the question of what the moral relevance of those attributes right. is, given that they have those attributes. Right. And it seems to me that last bit has to be a priori, or at least I don't right. know if any That's right. a posteriori ways of doing that. Is That's right. Did you mean to include both? Yeah, I, I meant to include both. I just sort of, uh, so it partly has to be empirical. It's a partly empirical inquiry uh, where you at least have to look at um, you know what attributes they have. That's an empirical question. But, but the you conditional, the, the conditional. If they have these attributes, then they have moral status. That's presumably a priori. That's really. That's right. That's right. You need to have a normative premise, and that normative premise is a priori. Thank you, Paul, for clarifying that for me. Thank Hi. you. Hi. Thank yeah. you so much for the talk. Yeah. Um, so, if you're taking the analogy between language and moral and morality, what roadblocks do you think will face trying to program in a universal moral grammar? that would be analogous to programming in language? Uh, I don't know. Uh, so I wish Stephen Wolfram was here. He can sort of answer that question. But um, I think that, oh, he, is he? Oh, maybe he wants to answer it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I'm relying on people like uh, Stephen to solve that problem for me. But the basic, uh, I mean, the general idea is that we need to uh, operate at a much lower level. This whole level about value alignment, et cetera, et cetera, maximization, seems like that's already, there's too much, too much, too many, it's too theory laden, there are too many things. Sort of the basic, they're sort of, before any of that, they're sort of, so this is not even a bottom up approach, this is sort of pre bottom up approach, in a sense that this m moral faculty is just sort of, it's the way we view the world and we see moral properties and moral values, things like harm, persons, et cetera, et cetera, and then some sort of mechanism for being able to combine those uh, different things and weight them, right? And so we need, uh, that seems like that's the way to go. And then uh, it's a further issue how these artificial moral agents, how they're gonna make decisions. They're, maybe they'll make better decisions than we will because they'll have more information. Maybe they'll make worse, et cetera. That's an open question, and I don't say anything about that. But just see, in terms of, uh, uh, one of the things I do want to say is that for AI researchers in the room, it seems like, you know, that could be explored. That could be uh, fruitfully explored. Thanks. All right. So I was just thinking because you put a lot of emphasis on like the material basis, yeah. and that, and like it seemed peculiar to me. I mean, like humans from a few hundred years ago clearly don't have the moral development that we have, even though they have practically the same DNA. Yeah. And you might have beings that have such bizarre forms, or you might have virtual entities, right, that like don't have DNA at all, or a way to assess like, but yet they might be extremely sophisticated. I, yeah, that's, uh, th thank you. I agree, that's why uh, the account more generally is the physical basis uh, for more agency, and that's why it can accommodate artificial intelligence. So. Um, it just so happens that all the living things that we know have the genet you know, use, you know, have genetic base, you know, genetic codes. But that might change in the future. And if that were to be the case, then uh, these other entities could also have more agency. Yeah. So, <coughs> yeah. Peter. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I wonder if it might be useful to distinguish between something like moral standing and value. So uh, moral standing, you might say, gets you into the category of being a rights holder. 
And um, then you might say, uh, no matter what your intelligence or other kind of value would be, that uh, you should have rights just like all the other rights holders. But I don't know if we want to say that rights holders always have precedence. So um, even a deontologist is probably willing to say there are some times when sacrificing a small human interest, if it would indeed reduce uh, the suffering of animals, let's say, in yeah. a very substantial way, yeah. uh, that that would be a, a morally good thing. And so even a, a deontologist isn't committed to the idea that we have only one notion in play here, standing, and that it's got to be graduated in the way you suggest. We might have it as a qualification for certain kinds of moral consideration, uh, holding responsible, things like that. But uh, we don't want that to, so to speak, be a, a, a bar against considering against human interests or against even uh, human claims that would be based on some kind of freedom of movement or action, um, uh, completely ignore the disvalue that we could cause to uh, other species. Uh, that, that sounds absolutely right. So that's why when I define moral status, I talked about portantal consideration. So it's just it's one reason, sort of other things being equal. Right. So and then the other thing I say is that when I talk about the function of right holding, I said that it has to be comparable interests. So if it's like one tiny interest of yours, but really, you know, if your tea is going to get cold and then there's a cat who's, you know, b being run over by a car, it seems like you should go save the cat, right? Because the <laughs> interests are not comparable. So I totally agree there. So it's not, it's, it's not, it doesn't have lexical priority. It doesn't sort of trump. Right. So there uh, will be a general yeah. principle that right holders have precedence. It, 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 it's a protanto yeah. when the interests are comparable. Uh, just sort of, uh, sort of. There's a um, a reason, a sort of pre, uh, well, prima facie reason. There's sort of a <laughs> sort of. I, I don't know. I'm just using it. That, yeah, sort of. There's a. Uh, there's a. It's. Uh, there's a. Um, uh, it's not an all things considered reason, right? So. Yeah. Okay. So if I'm understanding correctly, uh, you're arguing that. <coughs> Uh, whether an entity is a right holder is, can be understood by its potential as a moral agent, right? And so is, not, is the AI itself not a moral agent and therefore a right holder on equal footing with a living, uh, otherwise what we understand to be a living being? And therefore also with your, the second point that you made about uh, a, a, a person of average moral intelligence um, not being being on equal footing with someone of exceptional moral intelligence. So you could have a, a, an AI of low moral intelligence that is, has an equal moral status to an exceptionally moral living human. Um, I'm not sure if I quite follow that, but um, I think that... Um, uh, so what I wanted to say was that... Um, sorry, can you just... Uh, uh, is, the, is the AI not a moral agent? And, oh, yes. Okay. And by your definition, yeah. then, no, a AIs right could, holder yeah. on the same footing as yeah. a yeah. human being. Good. Be. So the AIs could be uh, moral agents if they have the physical basis for moral agency. So there's nothing that bars them from having uh, moral agency. Uh, in terms of the degree, I think that, so I'm, I'm around, I think that there's some sort of hierarchy of moral status. I, I, it, um, so I think that moral agency may be more, this is something that hasn't been developed, but I'm inclined to think that moral agency has value over uh, rational agency. So I'm imagine there's you, and then there's a really smart uh, paperclip making being, right? And which one should I save? It seems like I should save you rather than this super intelligent paperclip making being. And if that's the case, this seems like more agency has some sort of value overriding rational agency. But that's controversial. Okay. So, Wait, yeah. Can I ask one question? It's no, really quick. Uh, 